Welcome back. A constant theme that emerged from our first set of conversations related to the inability of governments to hold an open national debate within parliament and in civil society. As a result, no palpable consensus seems to have emerged. There is a powerful sense of deja vu and an inability to properly understand the massive demographic and social changes that have occurred in the critical areas, especially Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Balochistan, but extending also into the Punjabi head heartland. What did our experts tell us about these issues? Welcome, I'm Shaja Nawaz uh, from the Atlantic Council, and I'm delighted uh, to be connected today to Dr. Farad Taj, who is an authority on the Pakhtun area um, and the border region between Afghanistan and Pakistan, and who has continued her research on these topics uh, related to that area and to the Taliban and the anti-Taliban, as she calls them. She uh, is uh, currently an associate professor at the University of Tromsø in Norway. Uh, she has published a couple of books on the region, uh, and she's also written articles, including, among others, on the Pakhtun Tahafas movement, the PTM, which is a very critical part of the, the ongoing developments within the region. So, uh, Farad, uh, welcome uh, to this conversation. Um, I, I wanted to ask you to, first of all, help us understand the local environment that we are talking about, and particularly in light of the recent upsurge in violence and the apparently new declaration of war by the Tariqe Taliban Pakistan uh, on the Pakistani military institutions and the state uh, that was evident in the Peshawar bombing. And even today, there apparently was an attack on the Karachi Central Police Station, which the TTP has not yet claimed, but it's most likely linked. So could you give us a sense of what is the environment in which this resurgence has taken place? Thank you very much, uh, Sujanavas, for the invitation to participate in this uh, discussion. I'm grateful. Um, uh, where to start when um, you ask me this? And there are so many dimensions to this uh, issue, this, this, the way the society has changed. But I will just begin by the society in uh, Pakhtunkhwa, in the tribal area that we are talking about now. It's not the society that one sees in the colonial writings uh, uh, of the great game time. And it's not the society that one sees in the um, writings of the authors inspired by colonial writings. So it's not that society. The society has totally changed, um, especially during the war on terror. There is a, a totally new generation. Uh, that does that does not fit into this idea of tribal society led by tribal leaders, um, uh, a society that live by a cultural code, a code that somehow refused to evolve evolve with time. It's a society driven by vendetta. The, these these young people and. Uh, one expression of them uh, you can see in the in form of Pashtun Tahafuz movement. They are children who grew up. They are young men and women now, but they grew up in the war on terror uh, time. So they are chil they were children of war, and they are uh, people of this social media age. So they now know that in a normal society, uh, a normal society doesn't run by tribal norms. It, uh, it runs by uh, rights and, uh, and obligation-based contract with the state. And this is what they want, rights. Who, uh, rights which have been violated, massively violated during the war on, uh, on terror. And uh, many people use this, um, this word, the three Ds, the, the long, long trail of three, three Ds. And four Ds actually, four Ds, death, 
destruction, disappearances, um, and displacement. Uh, so they have been through all this thing and they are fed up with both Taliban, Taliban militants, uh, and also fed up with Pakistan army operations. So, uh, yeah, this is, this is the ground situation. That's a very interesting way of looking at it. And I assume that uh, you've looked at the demographic makeup of Pakhtun society also. Um, some numbers that uh, I uh, came across uh, in working with Khalid Ekram, who's an economist with the World Bank, uh, indicated that uh, some 300,000 of Pakhtun youth were between the ages of 16 and 25 in the 3.5 million that used to be the population of the old FATA, the, the different agencies that comprise FATA. Um, that, it, that means that it is now a fairly dominant group inside the population of uh, this region. And from what you're saying, we need to connect with them and make them part and parcel of any decision making. Is that so? Yes, exactly. Um, what uh, the Pakistan state and more precisely the policy, Afghan policy makers of, uh, of Pakistan, of our state, uh, the solution that they look for, I think they are very narrow minded solution. The solution involved tribal leaders, send them to negotiate with the, with the Taliban. And somehow they think that the negotiations that, that the tribal leaders would do or religious leaders would do, they would, be, um, they would bring sustainable peace. This is not going to happen. Again, because of these uh, demographic changes, um, for one, the if I can give you an example to explain it better, is that earlier, um, the tribal leaders and their decisions were reasonably effective. And the reason was that, that they used to lead a society that was a sm small society, a village community, and a tribal leader used to know each and every person by name, by face, even female members of uh, families, who is whose daughter, who is whose mother, uh, and so on. So the tribal leaders have a good overview of their society. Uh, they, they knew who does what and who is what, et cetera, et cetera. So in this context, the decisions that they made, they were reasonably okay decision and they were implementable and they were implemented. Now we see there is huge diaspora from this area. People are living um, as labor migrants in the Middle East. People have come to Europe, America. A huge population is in Karachi. Uh, this is the largest Pashtun city in the world. And also a huge population is in other areas of Pakistan. So a tribal leader sitting in the tribal area or in uh, any other place in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa has basically no idea who does what and um, who, who wants what and how and in what ways they would uh, affect the decision of the tribal leader. So this, this is not, it's not possible because of the change socioeconomic uh, dynamics there. Secondly, um, the tribal leaders decision in the past were backed by their lashkars. If somebody would defy the decision that they had tribal lashkars. This era is also gone. Lashkars uh, we cannot have now. Uh, the reason is that the militants, they have every kinds of weapons. Um, I mean, anti-personnel mines and every kinds of rockets, uh, M4 uh, rifle, M16, uh, suicide bombers. While the people who live on the ground, they are just civilian. So they are no match to the, to, um, to, uh, no match to the militants and their training. So that is another reason that the tribal leaders' decisions, they are, it's just a waste of time and a narrow, very narrow-minded uh, minded, um, uh, approach. Secondly, the Jirga system uh, that uh, 
very many people are very fond of, especially the, the writers and the, uh, the observers. The Pashtun jerga is romanticized so much. The jerga, uh, as I see it, has lost its, its, its relevance because of the two reasons I give uh, before, and also because of the corruption and nepotism that have uh, that have come into it. Um, for example, the, the, the jerga leaders, they consider themselves some kind of lawyers. And when you take services from a lawyer, you have to pay a fee. To the tribal leaders, you don't pay a fee in that sense, but you have to compensate by other means. For example, um, when they, these people come, the jerga comes to process a case, you have to slaughter uh, animal to feast, to feed them. Young people don't like this. So this, our state approach is through these traditional tribal structures and ideas. And this is, this, these are irrelevant. Narrow-minded solution, as I call them. <clears throat> I was also told uh, in my visits to uh, parts of Fata that uh, there was a change in the relationship between the mullah and the jirga. That traditionally, when you, you had the jirga and it was a circle of, of the tribal malaks that would sit together to decide on issues, the mullah sat outside and he was brought in at the end, basically to lead the prayers for the success of whatever decision had been reached. Uh, that situation has apparently changed now with the mullah acquiring much more uh, authority and power, uh, and in some cases assisted by the state in that purpose. Is that true? Um, that is uh, correct uh, to the extent that if the mullah is supported by the state or if the mullah is connected with militant groups, then of course they have power behind them and they do whatever they want and it doesn't matter what people, civilian, population, they want that does not matter but otherwise as i said the decisions that a, a religious leader would make they would be as ineffective as a tribal leader would make given the the demographic changes the diaspora communities um, and also the of course the civilian powerless and the armed militant groups um, so, so yes, what I think, um, uh, Suja, is that, that the state has to engage the, the, the population, the Pashtun population uh, in, uh, in Pakistan. Uh, Pashtuns are um, um, quite integrated in the state structure in Pakistan and in state institutions, military and, and police and bureaucracy. So that, is, that should be taken as, as strength. Uh, uh, but uh, you cannot take it for granted, I think, that you killing. Pakhtunkhwa or the former tribal area is killing ground, massacre ground, massacre after yeah. massacre after massacre for years and years and years, decades now. You can't take that, that, that kind of loyalty for granted. You see the, the last uh, attack on policemen in which 100 or so were killed. What happened after that? Uh, we saw pictures that policemen were uh, welcoming Manzur Pashtin. Yes. Why let is ask that? You, let me ask you this. What is the relationship uh, or is there any separateness between the Taliban of Afghanistan and the TTP today? Or are they one and the same? Yeah, that's a very uh, interesting question. Uh, often it is said they have ideological connection. They have been fighting together. The Taliban in Pakistan actually emerged in the context of the Afghan war. The madrasas that were, that were set, up, set up in the Afghan wars in Pakistan territory, they, uh, they were educated there. So this is the, the connection. Um, and also they have been fighting, both the Pakistani Taliban and the Afghan Taliban have been fighting together in Afghanistan with the, with the Americans. So that is another connection. But there is another connection that is often not spoken about, and especially in Pakistan, it is totally ignored. 
I have been asking uh, whenever I meet people in Afghanistan, uh, in Pakistan, uh, I said that it's it's not right that Pakistan doesn't talk about this issue. Um, but uh, let me first see the issue. And the issue is that this Afghanistan's claim over the the territory, the, the Pakhtunkhwa territory, the Pashtun area in Pakistan. When I say to someone in Pakistan and they say, well, Afghanistan is not on an international forum. It's not in the International Court of Justice, not in the UN. So there is no claim. No, this is not the issue. Afghanistan is waiting for the day when it will be in a position, it will be strong enough to make that claim, then it will make. In the meanwhile, Afghanistan had made sure that this issue remain alive in the minds and hearts of people. So there is huge Pashto language literature, poetry, huge that say that this area belongs to Afghanistan. Now, this, this is a very strong sentiment in Afghanistan, not in Pakistan. As I said, Pakistani Pashtuns are um, integrated, but this is a very strong sentiment in Afghanistan. And because of this, the Afghan state is sort of uh, trapped by its own people. Its own population doesn't accept that Afghanistan gave up on the Pashtun area. But Afghanistan is a weak state. It needs Pakistan for access to sea and, and all kinds of different, different things. So what the state does is that they sort of promote this, this Pashto language, Pashtun nationalist poetry and all, the, all that is in, in literature so that the issue remain alive. Um, but that is not enough for, from an ontological security perspective. That is not enough. People expect some action from the state. So what Afghanistan state does, it takes a very ambiguous stance towards our area, the Pashtun area in Pakistan. It sometimes it says, uh, the area should be given autonomy. There should be Pashtunistan. Sometimes it say um, that um, it's, um, uh, it, the area should be given autonomy within Pakistan so that it is not absorbed in Punjab. They have this kind of Punjabophobia that somehow we who are from Khyber Pakhtunkhwa or from the Farta area, we will be Punjabized. We will become Punjabi. So they have this kind of apprehension. So they say, give them an autonomous status within Pakistan. So sometimes they say this. And many a times they say, future of this area, this uh, uh, this depends on people of the area. So it's not for the Pakistan state, for the Afghanistan state, people will decide. This is undecided. So in this context, in this so much, this public perception is so strong. So ja, if you ask an illiterate person who has never been to school, madrasa, anything, but if you ask them about this area, they will give you that narrative. This is our area. This is Afghanistan. Who is Pakistan? It's a British project. It's an unnatural state. It has, it, is, it has been made on areas stolen from India and from Afghanistan. So this kind of discourse that they would give. Now in this discourse, you think Taliban will uh, support Pakistan? Taliban will accept the Durand line as international border? Even if they want, for example, the Haqqanis, they have been, and probably they are still are very close to the, our establishment, but even if the Haqqanis want, they can't. So I think they also, from the Afghanistan side, this, this Pashtun nationalist factor, they will use Taliban for, for that, to create trouble in Pakistan, to make sure that uh, they say we are, we are not Punjabis, but I wouldn't say that. I would say make sure that we are not integrated in Pakistan. So they will use Taliban for that. And if you look at, listen to some of the discourses, and they are in Pashto language, um, and they say that uh, Af uh, Afghanistan should extend full support to TTP because they are our fighting force, and we will break Pakistan with uh, with their help. So I so yes, they are the same. <laughs> Coming back to your question, TTP and Pak Afghan Taliban. Mm -hmm. My own information based on conversations with senior police and military people in Pakistan indicates that the Taliban of Afghanistan have uh, given access to the TTP 
to American weaponry, the very latest and very powerful weaponry that was left by the United States and the coalition forces in Afghanistan. And as a result, there are instances where the TTP can outgun the Pakistan military, the frontier corps, and the police. So um, this is now been well established and understood by the authorities inside Pakistan. Uh, let me uh, ask you briefly, uh, I'm very grateful for the background and the deep understanding that uh, you have of the people and the region. Let me ask you, what is the best way forward uh, out of the current situation, uh, other than for Pakistan to take a very strong military line or to, to have a pursuit policy across the border to attack uh, the TTP. Uh, what do you think is, is the, the most suitable long-term approach to resolving this issue of the TTP and the unhappiness uh, with the Pakistani state? Yes. Uh, and before I uh, come to this, uh, to respond to this, just a, a quick, um, the recently the delegation that went from Pakistan to Afghanistan to negotiate with the TTP. And you know the demand that they put on the table? That FATA should be turned back into FATA. Now it is integrated uh, into, uh, into Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. It should be turned back. Yes. What does that mean? To use that area as strategic space against Pakistan and ultimately to separate all the Pashtun areas from, from Pakistan. Yeah. So uh, that is now coming to your question. Yes, I think the, uh, uh, the best is and what should be is that um, engage with people. Ordinary. Stop, stop uh, going after these tribal leaders and sending them for negotiating with, with TTP. It sends a, a signal of weakness. It signals your weakness. You are a state, a nuclear armed state. Don't do this. This is these are terrorists, and you are so much. Uh, concerned about them, about their families in Pakistan, they have to be repatriated. What about the thousands and thousands of families who have suffered, who have lost their loved ones? There are thousands and thousands of people who have lost their body parts. What about them? I haven't seen any concerns expressed uh, by these Afghan policymakers in Pakistan for those people. So engage with them. People should be given civil rights political rights. Why is it that uh, Ehsan Ullah who is a terrorist, who accepted the, the army public school, uh, part, uh, his involvement in army public school, he is on media everywhere in Pakistan. He is interviewed for hours. But Manzoor Pashtin cannot come. Why? So, so this is important that stop looking at this area as strategic space start thinking as it as if it is part of the mainland pakistan and give people rights engage with them this is the only uh, the only way forward that that i see and and also stop the, these these internment centers you know how the fata has been done now the, it is not un, under the fcr but what they brought in the place of fcr this is the called this uh, interim governance uh, governance um, uh, ordinance uh, uh, this is called, what is the name of this? Interim Governance Regulation 2018. And it's worse than FARTA. Judicial powers are with the administrative officer and administrative officers in defective manner are the military officers. Luckily, this, this regulation was, um, 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 was struck down by, by Peshawar High Court. But then they also brought other kinds of regulation and other kinds of things, and internment centers have been made. People say they are, they are going to Namo Bay's of Pakistan. People are, disappeared, people are disappeared and tortured. You know, my own student was sent to those, uh, one of those internment centers. I was uh, teaching at that time at a you know, university in, in Pakistan. And one of my students was a normal, who is a normal boy. I did not see anything, note anything that could show that he has connection with Taliban, but he was disappeared for two years. He was disappeared. And then they left him go because they found nothing against him. 
his academic career is destroyed. Uh, his family life is destroyed. And this, ha- this is somebody that I know personally. But this has happened to hundreds and hundreds of people, thousands actually. Sh- stop this. Those people who you think are involved, bring them to the court and after trial, hang them. Nobody in Pakhtunkhwa cares for those people who killed. But stop, uh, uh, stop traumatizing people, innocent people like my student. So this has to be look in, looked into. So go by the law as much as possible. I understand it's a militancy situation. It might, might not be always possible to go by the law, but try to do as much as you can. Uh, and um, I wouldn't uh, mind if some of the terrorists, uh, top terrorists are killed, like Osama bin Laden, the way American killed him. So some of the top terrorists, yes, but but please stop uh, lifting, disappearing people on suspicion and then destroying their life, their health. Uh, so this is one reason that go by the law, include people and give them rights um, and show them that they are citizen. C- citizenship is obligation and, and rights. So obligation we accept, loyal citizen of Pakistan. I don't see any freedom movement in Pashtun area in. in. They are loyal citizens, but they, the state has to come forward and, and stop these things. Political rights we have. If you look at the constitution of Pakistan, it's strong on political rights side. It's relatively weaker on this uh, social rights side. But in case of our area, even the political rights, equality before the law, that you cannot put people in torture cells, this, these, these basic political rights are not given to us. Thank so, you. Focus more on people, their suffering, and, and stop thinking about terrorists and bring them in society and integrate them and use target, targeted intelligence-based operation to eliminate them. Thank you very much, uh, Farad Taj. We appreciate your knowledge of the region and um, your deep understanding. And your message of engagement uh, is very critical to resolving Uh, the issues that Pakistan faces in the border regions in Afghanistan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Welcome back. I'm Shujan Nawaz for the Atlantic Council, and I'm joined by a member of parliament of Pakistan, Mohsin Dabar, who has been a member of the National Assembly of Pakistan since 2018. Um, He comes from a region that has been seriously affected Uh, by the militancy and terrorism that Pakistan has been living with for the last 20 years. Um, And uh, he is also one of the few uh, people in parliament who has taken upon himself to become a spokesman, not just for the people of his region, but for Pakhtun uh, youth in general. Um, He is the co-founder of the Pakhtun Tahafiz movement. Uh, He is also the founder of the National Democratic Movement, which is a political party that he set up. Um, And and this is a a new development, particularly in in the area formerly known as the Fata, the federally administered tribal area, where the tradition was for tribal maliks and then in some cases, big businessmen to basically be elected to captive seats and then join whichever government was in power. Uh, that was kind of a, a, an oversimplification of the political process in, in the region. And so uh, his political party represents a departure from the past. Um, Mohsin, um, thank you for joining us. And could you give us a sense of what has happened in the so-called contract between the social contract between the state of Pakistan and the people of uh, the border region. Uh, well, thank you so much uh, uh, for inviting me to uh, this uh, very important uh, conversation. And uh, uh, in response of your question about uh, the social contract, um, I think uh, uh, this is very important to explain that. Uh, and um, I have always been, you know, uh, talking about that in my speeches that uh, the only uh, binding document between the masses and the 
state is the uh, the constitution of Pakistan and um, when uh, when that is gone and if that is not followed you know nothing else uh, remains between them and we have seen that uh, this constitution has been uh, violated again and again specifically um, in the context of the um, uh, the border areas like um, starting from the Afghan Jihad you know the way um, we have been used as a cannon fodder uh, for the Western interests and you know the way uh, the entire generation was uh, trained uh, to fight uh, for someone else's uh, strategic uh, interests and uh, you know when that war was over uh, there was no direction and uh, things you know uh, it was very much obvious that uh, they will have to they, they will they will backfire and that's what happened uh, after that. And then uh, we have seen the um, clash and cough culture. We have seen, you know, uh, the drugs and all things, you know, uh, which were affiliated uh, uh, after the with with the Afghan Jihad. Then you know we saw the the nine eleven, and after the nine eleven, um, the influx of uh, the then Taliban. Uh, to the border areas and again you know uh, they were welcomed uh, with uh, state glorification and the innocent people you know hardly had any um, uh, who, who, who were kept disconnected from politics also so that's why they, they, they did not have any idea about what is happening uh, uh, with them and uh, the, the only picture they saw uh, and they knew about uh, the Taliban uh, was you know a very glorified picture um, a very um, you know a honest and um, unique kind of divine picture you know which was portrayed in the print and electronic media of Pakistan so you know it was very much obvious for the general pe public also you know to welcome uh, them because uh, uh, these kind of sentiments they were uh, it was uh, they were installed in the minds of the general public and then you know we saw that um, um, these people, uh, the Taliban and the Al-Qaeda and every X, Y, Z, you know, you name it. All the militant organization, they, they came to uh, North Waziristan and specific and uh, the rest of Pashtunkhwa and the uh, tribal belt also. And then uh, once again, you know, the state remained a, a silent spectator. And then the next uh, phase was that... Um, um, was, when when the state decided that we are going to launch um, a military operation against uh, uh, against these militants, <laughs> then again, you know, they, they were uh, it was the uh, general public of that area who has to sacrifice. They they left their homes, they were displaced, they leave, they lived in camps, and with the hope that uh, one day they will go back and they will live a peaceful life. Um, back in their homes but you know even after the uh, prolonged military operations um, for many years you know when the people came back you know they uh, they saw destruction they saw their um, uh, markets and their uh, homes destroyed and ap apart from that uh, they saw you know extreme level of humiliation also uh, for no reason you know for uh, simple mistake, you know, I would say that, that, that was not a mistake also, you know, and uh, uh, humiliation on check posts and, and things like that. So the only thing they didn't saw was the, the piece for which they, uh, the, the, the entire exercise uh, was done. And um, then... Now, let me interrupt if I may and ask you, because the displaced people and their difficulties is what prompted you and others to set up the the Pakhtun Tahafas movement, uh, which was to protect the rights of the people of, of the region. Is that correct? Well, you know, even after the displacement, as I said, that when we uh, went back, when the people went back, uh, uh, the, the, their hope, uh, the only hope, the, the hope with, with which, you know, they, um, they lived the displaced life, uh, it was it was gone and instead they saw uh, 
uh, more destruction, more torture, more humiliation. And that was something, you know, which uh, when uh, we saw that uh, enough is enough, you know, we do not have any uh, um, any reason left, you know, um, to be respected in this uh, country. We have followed each and every action, you know, uh, and uh, the only hope was that after these military operations, you know, it was, you know, uh, it was opinion of a layman, you know, who did not have any understanding of the politics of whatever is happening in the region. But, you know, it was general opinion that he, uh, after this operation, we will go back and then uh, we will uh, live um, um, respectable, respectful life. But when, uh, when that phase came, uh, uh, it was even more worse than uh, than the previous. So then, you know, uh, uh, it, it, it was, you know, um, uh, something which was awaited, you know, because uh, till then, uh, one thing which I would uh, also put uh, on the political forces also, you know, of the entire region, because whatever was happening in that region, uh, nobody spoke. Uh, for that area. Uh, the political leadership was silent on whatever was happening. So that's why, you know, the uh, 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 there was something, uh, you know, which was uh, um, uh, uh, building on and on and then, you know, then it uh, came out uh, in the shape of uh, what you have mentioned. Well, let me ask you then uh, about the Pakhtun Tahfuz movement, but also about the general issue that you've described, the silence of the political parties. Um, now, for those that don't uh, know you well, uh, when you ran for parliament in 2018, you actually defeated uh, the candidate of the PTI, Imran Khan's party, and the candidate of the uh, MMA, the, the Muslim Alliance. The Muslim Party's alliance, and so um, it, it was clear that you represented something different. So, talk to me about the emergence of the political youth in the border region, and why you think that is an important development. You know, uh, something you know, uh, um, which uh, um, uh, like the displacement. It was um, it was a miserable. Uh, uh, you know, situation. Um, it was a miserable part of the life, you know, of, uh, of all the people, you know, of uh, their region. You know, but something which better happened during that time was that uh, uh, all those people who were kept disconnected from uh, the mainstream Pakistan, who were kept disconnected uh, from politics, who were uh, kept disconnected from media and all these things, when they got displaced, you know, then uh, they got connected with the political parties, you know, and they, uh, with the mainstream Pakistan, they learned about how to uh, protest for your rights. They came to know about the press clubs, they came to know about the courts. And, um, and, and apart from that, they got a tool also to express their opinion, which was the social media. And uh, so, so this is the emergence of uh, the youth and... Uh, um, the uh, by default uh, situation and then you know uh, the availability of uh, some tools to express uh, you know uh, their grievances so all these three things you know uh, and many other factors you know they uh, coincided you know and then um, they uh, emerged as a, as a as a voice uh, of the voiceless uh, people of, uh, of 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 that region, and you know specifically um, about the youth of that area, because you know once you go through an experience, and once you had an, a first-hand experience of uh, of all the political developments, you get a more deeper understanding of whatever is happening in in the region. You know, even you know if 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 someone tried to convince you through his speeches. Uh, like if someone, if even a political leadership tries to convince someone through his speeches or uh, lectures or whatever you call it, 
But you know, on the other side, if you have a first-hand experience of whatever is happening in, in that region, you get more deeper understanding of, uh, of, of the facts. So that's what happened with the youth of uh, the border areas. They, um, most of them, you know, they saw these uh, uh, deaths and destruction, you know, since they, they were born. So, you know, so, uh, this deep analysis, you know, and uh, um, uh, being through all these, times you know it, it it brought you know a very deep understanding uh, and they uh, they come out with some very uh, strong uh, political thoughts uh, realizing you know um, all the situation with facts and figures you know so so these things you know with it it, it it brought a clarity in the minds of the youth of that area, which is, I think, very much important um, for any moment on or any other objective uh, uh, in life. And it's very important for Pakistani society as a whole. Now, what a lot of people also don't understand is that the youth, particularly in the border region, in the in the old Fatah, uh, are now the majority of the population. And they also don't understand something that I'd like you to explain to us, which is the conflict between the Taliban and the people of the region. Now, uh, it's interesting that uh, your colleague in the National Assembly, uh, Ali Dawar, who was, uh, sorry, Ali Wazir, I was uh, switching his tribe. Uh, Ali Wazir uh, has just spent two years in jail and was released only on February 14th. Uh, but he lost so many close family members to attacks by the Taliban. And a lot of people don't understand this internal conflict because the Taliban were also trying to either coerce or recruit the youth of the region. Is that correct? Well, yes, you know, uh, that's how, um, you know, uh, it happened uh, in the border areas because uh, all uh, what, as I said in the start, that uh, the only thing the general pe people public knew about uh, the Taliban were, you know, their glorified face, which was portrayed by um, print and electronic media and all other sources in uh, Pakistan when they were in power in Afghanistan, you know. So we as a kids, you know, uh, when uh, Taliban, when we were in school, you know, so they were always, you know, portrayed very much positively in Pakistan and it had an impact on the minds of uh, um, general public and, and the youth also. And apart from that, you know, uh, the way, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the way it was connected uh, with jihad and the way it was more even and more glorified uh, when you when uh, when us came to afghanistan and um, um so so it was and i still remember that uh, i was in college when we went to uh, lahore for the uh, tablighi ijtima and uh, we saw even there you know the uh, the 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 songs and the uh, glorifications you know of uh, in, in different kind of poetry and things like that about for taliban and the praise of Osama bin Laden and all. So it was almost everywhere in every second mosque. And I believe that it wasn't happening without the patronage of state. And so, so this kind, in, in this kind of environment, it was very much obvious that when, when these people, when they came to, uh, to our areas, it, they, were, they were welcomed by the general public, including youth, including, you know, uh, including everybody. But, you know, when the passage of time, when the... When their identities uh, were revealed, you know, and the general public uh, came to know, you know, the uh, when they get they, when they got more understanding about uh, the facts uh, and um, um, how you know um, um, they were, you know, conducting themselves. By that time, the time was gone, and you know the. Uh, uh, they had almost uh, taken over and uh, established a mini state in Waziristan and even the rest of the uh, region also. 
and, and at that time it was something. not possible for a uh, general public uh, to contain them then you know when after the uh, uh, the military operations and uh, by during all that time the only thing the positive thing which came out of that was that uh, people came to know about um, uh, the reality of uh, uh, the Taliban and all the other groups, you know, operating uh, with different names. Now, uh, there is a very clear understanding across the board. And this is very much important. It is a very clear understanding across the board in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, in the border areas, that um, uh, we will not uh, uh, tolerate any kind of uh, uh, militancy in our region. I mean, we will not let them come back. And this is the only thing, this is very much important, whatever I'm saying, this is the only thing which has contained the militancy up to some extent till now. Because um, other than that, uh, the state, either they have facilitated or they have failed to contain them. Whatever meaning you uh, one should, you know, uh, draw from... Uh, the current situation, uh, or I would rather than say that um, uh, their response has always been, you know, um, um, very passive. And you do, uh, when the recent talks was held with the Taliban, um, I categorically said that it is a, a plan to bring them back uh, to the region. So the only thing which has contained um, the Taliban up to some extent is the public pressure and the general public opinion uh, which is now against the Taliban. What you're saying then is that if the government were wiser than it has been, that it would leverage uh, this feeling, particularly among the youth in the border region, uh, to act as a barrier against the Taliban. Uh, let me also go back to something you said earlier, you talked about the the Ijtama, the big uh, annual gathering uh, at Raiwind of the Tablighi Jamaat. It has always been widely believed that that is where a lot of the militant organizations did their recruitment along the outsides of that particular event, which was supposed to be a religious gathering. So what you're saying is a confirmation that there was a link between the Taliban and some of the Punjabi uh, groups that uh, eventually ended up supporting their activities. Is, is that correct understanding? Well, I think it was, uh, it was across the country. And um, uh, it still, you know, um, remains in my mind because, you know, uh, uh, we were uh, saying, you know, uh, we, we were coming across such kind of uh, um, uh, anthems, you know, of jihad and in the favor of Taliban and in the favor of Osama bin Laden, everywhere. I still remember because that year was very much crucial and it was uh, um, after 9-11, you know, uh, when, uh, when the U.S. came to Afghanistan. And uh, not just in that area, it was almost in the every second mosque of the country. And I believe that, uh, once again, that it was not uh, something like that which was happening without the uh, consent of, uh, um, without the patronage of our state. And it was everywhere, you know, like it was a, um, it was a general perception which was uh, building, it was uh, um, a kind of general opinion. And, you know, it was the same time when um, MMA was, uh, um, brought uh, into power in the Khyber uh, Pakhtunkhwa uh, province. And that was so also, the you know, religious coalition, the Yes, MMA. the coalition of yeah. the religious parties in, in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. And it was dialing because I still remember the speeches of some of their leaders where they said that uh, we, our fight is uh, directly with America and its allies. We do not care and we do not give much importance to Parvez Musharraf or all the other political parties. Our fight is uh, with America and someone if wants to uh, support us, it means they are against America. And if someone wants to fight against America, 
they better vote for us. So this was, you know, a, a common narrative, you know, and everybody knew that how uh, the, the religious parties, uh, how different religious parties were brought together and, uh, you know, form um, um, their alliance, you know, their, their alliance was formed. So, so, so like this was a common uh, perception that was, you know, happening uh, with the state support. It, it, it didn't happen without that. Let's look to the future a little bit now. Uh, I was uh, interested in learning that you recently visited Quetta. And uh, previously, you were barred from entering Quetta uh, because uh, it was the state felt that uh, perhaps you were not a positive influence on the people of the region or on the youth of the region, that you may help them organize in a manner that the state may not approve. So uh, do you see this as an opening now and the fact that um, uh, Ali Wazir has also been uh, released? Do you see this as a positive sign for the future? Well, I think if, um, freedom of movement is uh, the basic human rights of, um, of every citizen of uh, this country. Um, I was stopped many times uh, from entering to Balochistan. That was unfair, illegal, unconstitutional. Ali Wazir was kept uh, in jail for 26 months. Uh, that was again, you know, uh, illegal. And uh, there was similar nature of cases, you know, when he used to get bail in one, he was charged in another one and it got prolonged. Um, uh, for more than two years. So he was in prison for 26 months. So I believe that uh, it is the right of um, uh, uh, every uh, uh, citizen of this country that... Um, but there are still more things, you know, which uh, uh, which are still there. Like we are, we are barred from going out of the country. My name is uh, uh, still on exit uh, control list. And uh, many other of our friends, they are still in prison. Our friend Hanif Pashtin is uh, still in prison. The parents of Gula Ismail, you know, they, they also, you know, kept um, attending court cases, you know, which was, uh, which were fake and malicious and based on the activism of uh, their daughter. Uh, luckily, uh, they also got, you know, uh, acquitted um, um, a few days ago. But they are still also still on ECL, so so a lot. There is a lot which needs uh, uh, to be done, and more than everything, you know, the thing which is needed in this recent crisis and the emergence of uh, militancy is the change uh, in policy, because you know the unclear and the ambiguous uh, signals, uh, you know, which uh, are keep. Uh, you know, which which are uh, uh, sent, you know, on a regular basis uh, to the um, general public and uh, the security forces, you know, including police and other forces. Uh, it is, you know, it is uh, demoralizing them uh, because uh, today we sit together and we decide that uh, there will be no talk with any uh, band outfit and, or any militant outfit. And after a few years again, uh, uh, we we start talking to them and we start giving them space and then they come back and then they start killing people again. And uh, you know the questions then again, it will keep rising that uh, um, we have been saying from the very first day that this is this project Taliban and we have seen the uh, statements of the Parvez Musharraf and other many, you know, um, uh, um, people also who have been saying that uh, we um, uh, formed and we created, uh, we formed Taliban and we, uh, and uh, up to the, and for a very long time, you know, we have been saying, being a p p political workers and the, the people who with, the, uh, who has, you know, political opinion, like us, as we have been saying that uh, the Afghan Taliban and the Pakistan Taliban have been the same thing. And we have been supporting the Afghan Taliban uh, for a very long time. 
and which you know then who then were supporting the Pakistani Taliban. So it was you know the same circle in which uh, our state machinery was operating and uh, whether it was deliberate or it was I, I would definitely say that they were not innocent if a, if a, if a common man know that what is happening that who is supporting uh, these militants I don't believe that uh, they were not aware of uh, the connection between the Afghan Taliban and Pakistan Taliban and still they were supporting the Afghan Taliban so I believe that it was a policy it was a state policy and um, and this uh, and and that has brought us to the uh, destruction uh, and the you know and that has brought us to the situation where we are right now and I still think that there is no change in the, the policy right now and if we keep going with the same mindset and in the same policy I think uh, we will we will be we will consumed in the fire with which we are playing I'm sorry to end on such a pessimistic note, but uh, it's very important to hear your views uh, and the people that you represent, not just in your uh, constituency, but in the region as a whole uh, and the youth of the region uh, in, um, in the border areas of Khyber uh, Pakhtunkhwa as well as Balochistan. So um, on behalf of the Atlantic Council, I want to thank you, Mohsen Dabar, for taking the time. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to you and Atlantic Council for inviting me. Thanks a lot. Hello again. It's Shujan Nawaz for the Atlantic Council, and I'm joined now by Madhya Afzal, an economist who uh, is a fellow in the foreign policy program of the Brookings Institution. She formerly was the David Rubenstein Fellow uh, in the same program at Brookings. Uh, she's also taught at the University of Maryland. And she's also the author of a book called Pakistan Under Siege, Extremism, Society and the State, uh, which would be an interesting segue to our discussion of today, because the issues that she identified uh, are still active and maybe more than active today. Uh, so Madhya, welcome. And I wanted to ask you, as you look back on the last uh, decade or so, particularly in the aftermath of the attack on the army public school in Peshawar, do you see any similarities to what the government reaction has been following the attack on the, bo the, the mosque bombing in, in Peshawar? Thanks for having me uh, for this discussion. Thanks to you, Shuja, and uh, to the Atlantic Council. Um, you know, this, the last few months, uh, the last year and a half, really, after the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan and the, you know, the repercussions uh, it has had in Pakistan uh, in terms of increasing violence in Pakistan, it really is sort of brings for me this kind of sense of sad deja vu, you know, sort of very reminiscent of um, what was happening in Pakistan in the kind of the 2012 to 2015 time frame, um, and the government response, you know, throughout the terrorist attacks that Pakistan experienced, uh, you know, once the Pakistani Taliban, the TTP, took the form that it did, has been uh, yes that it will try to counter extreme uh, counter terrorism, but it's always been. Um, sort of the sense of obfuscation. We will not let the enemy succeed in their nefarious designs. You know, sort of that kind of um, that kind of sort of wording, uh, etc. But never actually really pointing to the problem, right? Never actually saying, uh, you know, this is the group that's responsible. This is how. This is what its ideology is, and this is why this group. Um, let's say it's the TTP, let's say it's ISIS, whoever it is. Uh, this is why its ideology is unacceptable to us. Uh, and, and this is how we're going to counter it. You know, never that kind of uh, direct um, sort of, um, uh, you know, approach uh, or counter to this issue. And the, the one thing I'll say that differentiated, uh, you know, the post uh, army public school um, uh, sort of reaction and the post Peshawar bombing reaction is that um, at that point, the military was already engaged in an operation, Zerbeazb, 
um, that began in uh, the summer of 2014 after an attack uh, at the Karachi airport um, against the, the TTP. And that, while it was a complicated operation, was less complicated than an operation would be now uh, because of the fact that now the Pakistani Taliban and other militants have refuge in Afghanistan, have sanctuary in Afghanistan, which is controlled by the Afghan Taliban. And so it's a much more, it's, it's a more complicated environment uh, for a military operation. And at that point, there was a military operation already underway. And it just, you know, the, uh, the army public school attack just gave um, uh, kind of, uh, just pushed it further uh, and sort of uh, in increased the resolve in some sense of the military. And at this point, there isn't a military operation uh, of that extent underway, and it would be much more complicated in that environment. And that's putting aside any of the issues of countering ideology, which the Pakistani state did not do then. And it's uh, not clear that the Pakistani state understands how to do them now. Oh, you may have answered this question already in your explanation, but why do you think that the government wishes to be indirect or to obfuscate, as you said, rather than to define the problem for what it is and find a way of attacking the problem? Well, the Pakistani, you know, I, I cover this sort of extensively in my book, uh, but it is difficult for the Pakistani state to shift its ideological kind of position. And it's, it's uh, you know, identity, the, the sort of two pillars that its identity are based on, you know, one of religion and one of opposition to India uh, or the enmity um, uh, with India have kind of led to it, you know, defining itself a certain way. And it's all seeped through into its laws, its education system, its politics. Um, and at this point, uh, when the Pakistani state, for instance, has to uh, counter a group like the Pakistani Taliban, which says, uh, you know, we want to impose Sharia in Pakistan. It becomes very difficult for a state that has relied on religion as a central pillar of its identity and its existence, but it can still say, uh, so so, so it, it, it becomes complicated for it and it doesn't really necessarily want to go into that conversation. Uh, because it has used religion for its own sort of strategic purposes. Um, but, uh, you know, I would argue that it can still say something to the, you know, which is a complicated conversation, but say, you know, we are a Muslim democracy, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, our constitution is sacrosanct. Uh, and, you know, this group that does not believe in our constitution, that doesn't believe in that is existentially opposed to the Pakistani state and constitution, you know, as, as it has been for the last 75 years, is unacceptable to us. That is the kind of conversation it needs to have. But that is a difficult conversation for a state that has all too often relied on uh, religion for its own purposes. I said another conversation that should be taking place is between the state, including the military, and the local population of what used to be Fatah and or Balochistan, of course, uh, and that is the youth uh, of that local population, which is now the dominant demographic in the region. Can we talk about that? Absolutely. It's a conversation that's not being had uh, at this point in time, and it wasn't being had even then uh, in the sort of the 2014, 2015 timeframe. Um, and many of the youth and, and others, you know, the population really complained uh, that they were kind of you know, Zerbe Az, while it was an effective operation, and then sort of it's the next iteration, Radul Fasad, you know, while they were effective military operations, um, they were conducted essentially in secrecy with the, the rest of the country only receiving information that the military um, uh, released, right? And it, you know, the reports that came through from, uh, you know, locals in the area, um, in terms of sort of, uh, you know, the displacement that they experienced, etc., cetera, um, uh, were, were not something that the, the country saw. Um, and then, of course, as, uh, you know, in, the, in recent years, 
the Taliban has essentially the Pakistani Taliban militants have returned from Afghanistan into that area and locals have been complaining about that and they've actually risen up against um, uh, you know, rising militancy in, in SWAT, for instance, the very sort of prominent protests. There are movements, uh, of course, um, uh, sort of political movements that uh, one example being the Pashtun Tahafuz movement, um, you know, which have engaged in protests, etc., but which have been suppressed by, by the state. It is not an open conversation. When I uh, interviewed students, um, uh, if, you know, in that kind of the 2013 to 2015, 2016 timeframe, again, you know, what, one big complaint they had is you don't know what's going on there because you're only hearing one side of the story. So sort of bringing that all out into the open and actually having a conversation about their desires for, uh, you know, their, uh, their local area um, and what they're actually seeing on the ground, the fact that, you know, they are not okay with rising militancy and that it affects them directly um, and that military operations also have an adverse effect on local populations that often goes unacknowledged in you know the areas of Punjab and Sin and urban areas where you know we don't actually see uh, those kinds of military operations I think that's uh, that's enormously important and from what you're describing uh, it appears that uh, groups like the apex committee that the prime minister convened recently in Islamabad may be unaware of many of these thought processes that exist in Balochistan or among the youth of what used to be known as Fata. So they're, they're acting on incomplete information themselves because the media are not uh, being used as a medium to get this information to them. Absolutely. I think, you know, I mean, honestly, in the post 2014 timeframe, we saw uh, a national action plan created, right? I mean, I think the army public school attack, I would say really shook the country to its core in a way that, you know, no attack before or since ha has shaken Pakistan to its core. But even then the kind of, um, beyond the military operation, the kind of plans it came up with, you know, the national action plan were, uh, superficial at best and and not heeded, uh, you know, so even the plans that, you know, the, the, the sort of the 20 points that existed in the National Action Plan were not followed through. This sort of apex committee, this, this desire to uh, have an uh, all parties conference, which actually hasn't materialized yet, you know, all of those are, uh, again, uh, you know, sort of more superficial, um, symbolic kind of gestures, but in essence, what is really required in parliament, you know, this can start in parliament, but it doesn't need to. Um, this is this is a larger conversation for the for the country. And it it doesn't have to be just top down. It needs to, as you said, incorporate uh, voices um, uh, from the from the ground up. Um, it, it really needs to be sort of a, a fundamental reimagining of the way Pakistan deals with extremism um, and the way, you know, it, it sort of teaches tolerance in its schools or its madrasas, um, the way it defines uh, its, its identity uh, in, you know, in its curriculum, um, the way, you know, a, a reexamining of how some of its laws um, have promoted uh, in intolerance. And, you know, I think that those links uh, between sort of intolerance, uh, between kind of the, the roots of extremism, and then uh, the, the end case of, you know, militancy, those links are not fundamentally understood. And in some sense, you know, if we go back to the, 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 maybe even the middle or the end of the military operation against the Pakistani Taliban, which was successful, one can say, uh, that that only, you know, averted the crisis for the time being, that something or the other was going to come up um, sooner or later, because the fundamental sort of roots of militant militancy, roots of jihadism were not tackled, um, you know, driving the groups into Afghanistan and putting them in jail was not enough. Um, so something or the other was going to happen that was going to reignite the problem. And in Pakistan's case, what has happened is 
the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan, uh, the return of the Pakistani Taliban into these areas, but also then the misguided attempt um, once again to negotiate with the group, which allowed it to become stronger. Um, and uh, the lack of you know, ideological pushback uh, towards the group, um, which has essentially allowed it to conduct its attacks. Uh, combined with, uh, as I've you know mentioned before already, this sort of logistical environment that makes it difficult to conduct a military operation. And of course, all this is being done by a government that is politically uh, weakened by uh, fissures from within. Uh, it's, a, it's a coalition of different parties uh, that don't always uh, stay on the same page uh, and uh, are facing probably the worst economic crisis that the country has faced in decades. So uh, against this background, what do you see as emerging? Right, the, the, the rest of the environment, right? The context in Pakistan uh, in 2022 and 2023 um, makes it extraordinarily difficult to focus on countering uh, you know, extremism, countering terrorism, having these conversations, because at this point, um, you know, this government is essentially, um, you know, putting out fires, you know, left, right and center. Uh, and that tends to be the case, you know, in a, in, a, in a hotly politically contested environment such as Pakistan's is at all times. But I think this is a particularly fractured uh, time politically for the country. And then the fact that it's on the edge of default um, makes it very difficult. So it's, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, sort of these, I would say the three kind of multi-crises that, the, the, that Pakistan has that are three-pronged and perhaps equally serious and uh, problematic, you know, the economic crisis, the political crisis, and the, um, the insecurity uh, crisis. Uh, make it very difficult to counter actually to deal with any of these issues um and and so i unfortunately i mean i i wish i could be optimistic i generally tend to try to be um but i would say that i don't necessarily see a uh, major action being taken against the the insecurity and militancy issues until there is a new government in some sense you know, because there's a, an election set to be held later this year, uh, my sense is that, uh, you know, sort of major decisions on these fronts, you know, are going to be taken then. I think at this point, the government has its hands full with the, uh, with the economic crisis. So um, major decisions on the, the militancy front are probably going to come if they do, right? I mean, there is sort of... Uh, always this danger that, that Pakistan will try to sort of muddle along on this, um, which won't make the problem go away. Uh, uh, and, 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 you know, it'll rear its, its head again as it, as it has in the past. But um, at this point, there isn't any conversation that is being had, any serious conversation uh, at the political level uh, with all the political stakeholders involved, right? Because even with the army, uh, even with the um, all parties conference, you know, Imran Khan, Imran Khan said that he would not, for instance, participate. So there needs to be at least, uh, you know, a, 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 a place, whether it's parliament uh, or elsewhere, where all of Pakistan's kind of the political stakeholders, and these need not and should not be just political stakeholders at the federal level. In fact, you know, people. Um, you know, those in, in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, in Balochistan, uh, really, uh, even if they don't have a say uh, in, in, in parliament, need to be taken on board because they are the ones being affected by this most directly. Um, uh, so that kind of conversation needs to be had. But in this kind of fractured political environment, I think it's exceedingly difficult to, to have that occur. Thank you, Madhya. I think you, you've laid out what could be uh, a way forward, um, but it's not an easy path. But thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. So where do we stand today? Pakistan appears unable to act speedily 
it appears to have fallen back on the old national action plan of the post-APS attack of nine years ago, essentially a laundry list of issues that were identified but never examined with a view to finding solutions. They met a traditional death by committee. The civil-military divide bedevils decision-making, and despite the presence of a powerful National Security Committee, an apparatus that could bring civil and military leaders into a single room, there have been few decisions on a national consensus. In, indeed, political divisions have deepened between the center and the provinces. Over everything in Pakistan today looms an economic crisis that is not going to be short-lived. It has been brought about by years of poor governance of successive governments that shunned fiscal responsibility and fed the hunger of powerful elites. Profligate spending aimed at buying votes seems to have been the order of the day. The begging bowl has become, unfortunately, a symbol of modern Pakistan, as any number of commentaries and cartoons will indicate. And Pakistan struggles to meet the demands of international financial institutions that require financial and physical discipline from the country. And without that, their assistance is going to be hard to get. If the economy collapses, terrorism and militancy may pose an even larger threat to the Pakistani state. The answers we believe, and our interlocutors whom you've heard believe, lie within Pakistan as our civil and security experts have identified. This is now a time for action, not just words. If proper actions are taken and sustained, not just by the current government, but whichever government is elected by the next elections in Pakistan and maintained for the next few years, Pakistan could become a thriving and stable anchor for regional peace and security and a major economic powerhouse, provided it makes the right choices and acts upon them. Muddling through is not an option. We hope you agree. Thank you for joining us. I'm Shujah Nawaz for the Atlantic Council.